This is Sean Thomas Radcliffe. Welcome to another episode of Preservation Oaks. In this series, we introduce you to professionals from museums, cultural, genealogical, and historical societies across the United States. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. Good day, everyone. Thanks for being here. Welcome to October and Family History Month. We have a great program for you today entitled The 19th Century and the Family Historian. As a genealogist, down through the years, I've encountered intriguing patterns in family dynamics appearing in different federal census records. One moment, a family is living independently and the next they appear to be residing with another family members or an elder family member, like a grandmother or grandfather or both. At first, I assumed it might be due to the elder member needing support in their old age, or the family expanding and seeking help to raise their grandchildren. However, one particular research assignment shed new light on this phenomenon. I discovered information about a family that had lost everything during a financial downturn, which provided an entirely new perspective to consider. And in this, our Halloween episode, we will. I can almost guarantee that you and the kiddos will be scared out of your wits by this episode because we're going to explore the significant impact of the 19th century on families and its implications for family historians. So gather round, everyone, as we delve into the historical context of this era and examine the various aspects of 19th century life and the socioeconomic effects on households. Our exploration will uncover how factors during this period influenced family dynamics, livelihoods, social structures, and the overall well-being of individuals throughout the 1800s. By understanding this historical context, we can gain deeper insights into the lives of our ancestors and their experiences during this transformative century. I'm Sean Thomas Radcliffe, and I'm coming to you from Salt Lake City, and this is Preservation Oaks, the original talk program on MicroStream Radio where we feature information about museums, cultural and heritage institutions, associations, historical and genealogical societies, and history-focused media creators across the United States. Our main platform is preservationoaks.podbean.com, but you can find us on nearly all podcast platforms as well as Rumble, Getter, Minds, TikTok, Facebook, Odyssey, and YouTube. So wherever you listen to the program, I appreciate it very much when you like, comment, follow, or subscribe. If you're listening and you'd like to be a guest on the program or if you have questions or comments about the program, spin off an email to preservationoaks at gmail.com. On our next episode of Preservation Oaks, we meet with CEO Tyson Weinert from the Evergreen Aviation and Space Society located in McMinnville, Oregon. I've really been looking forward to this episode because among other fabulous exhibits, this society has something that is truly unique in all the world. Let me set the stage for everyone out there who is not familiar with this particular wonder. You see, a long time ago, about 1942, there was a very rich man. His name was Howard Hughes, and he was an engineer, but also a patriot. During World War II, the U.S. government found itself in need of a colossal transport plane, 
and Howard Hughes collaborated with fellow manufacturers to bring this vision to life. The result was nothing short of exceptional, a one-of-a-kind aircraft officially christened as the Hercules. However, it's more commonly recognized by the nickname the Spruce Goose. Why the Spruce Goose, you ask? Well, it earned this name because it's the largest flying boat ever constructed and boasted the most expansive wingspan of any aircraft known until the momentous flight of the twin fuselage scaled composites strato launch on April 13, 2019. This historic aircraft remains remarkably well preserved. After being open to the public in Long Beach, California from 1980 to 1992, it found its new home at the Evergreen Aviation and Space Society, where it continues to awe and inspire visitors in McMinnville, Oregon. And we're going to talk to the society who is preserving it for their community and the nation. Cool, huh? All right, that being said, let's get this show snapping. Since this is our Halloween episode, I started wondering, as I often do, about how people all across the world have long established traditions about the dead and spirits in the fall of the year when it starts to get dark and spirits are said to be more able to roam the land. Then I thought, well, those traditions are mainly European, right? With witches and whatnot. And it turns out, no. There seems to be something spooky in the air for all people across this planet at this time of year. Various non-European cultures around the world have traditions that share similarities with Halloween, particularly in the fall when they celebrate the spirits of the dead, witches, and other supernatural entities. These traditions often have deep cultural and historical significance. Here's a few examples. The first is the Mexican Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. Celebrated from October 31st to November 2nd, Dia de los Muertos is a Mexican holiday that honors deceased loved ones. Families create ofrendas, or altars, with offerings of food, marigolds, and items that the deceased enjoyed in life. It's a festive celebration with parades, sugar, skulls, and face painting reminiscent of Halloween. There's the Chinese Hungry Ghost Festival, observed in several East Asian countries, including China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. The Hungry Ghost Festival typically falls in the seventh month of the lunar calendar, which corresponds to late summer or early fall. It's a time to honor deceased ancestors and appease wandering spirits. People burn offerings and perform ceremonies to ensure the spirits are well-fed and content. There's the Korean, I'm going to butcher this name, there's the Korean Chuseok, also known as Korean Thanksgiving Day. It's celebrated in South Korea in late September or early October. While primarily a harvest festival, it includes ancestor veneration and paying respects to deceased family members. Families visit ancestral graves and offer food and drinks. There's the Japanese Oban Festival. It's celebrated in Japan during July or August, depending on the region. It's a time when Japanese people honor the spirits of their ancestors. Families visit graves, light lanterns, and participate in traditional dance festivals. There's the Filipino Pang Ang Alulu Wa in some regions of the Philippines, particularly in rural areas, there's this tradition called Pang Ang Alulu Wa, which takes place around Halloween. People dress as spirits and go from house to house, singing and asking for offerings for the dead. Then there's African ancestral worship. Many African cultures have traditions of ancestor veneration, and rituals to honor the deceased. These may not be tied to a specific date like Halloween, but are important cultural practices. For example, the Yoruba people of Nigeria have Igungun festivals where masked 
performers embody ancestral spirits. These traditions often blend elements of honoring the dead, celebrating the harvest, and acknowledging the supernatural. While they share some similarities with Halloween, they are unique in their respective cultures and regions, and the specific customs and beliefs vary widely. Then I started thinking about Native American tribes across the United States, and it turns out that there are several Native American tribes in the United States that have traditions and ceremonies that share some similarities with Halloween, particularly in terms of honoring the dead and celebrating the changing of seasons. These traditions are often rooted in cultural and spiritual practices, and here's a few examples. The Cherokee have the New Moon Ceremony. I'm not even going to try to pronounce what it actually is, the word, but it's called the New Moon Ceremony. It takes place in autumn. It's a time for the Cherokee to offer thanks for the harvest and remember the deceased. The Nez Perce have what's called the First Salmon Ceremony, and again, I'm not going to try to pronounce this, which is a celebration that includes dancing and feasting, it's a time to honor the salmon and ancestors. The Hopi have the Niman Kachina, which is also known as the homegoing. The Hopi tribe has the Niman Kachina, a ceremony that marks the return of the Kachina spirits to the spirit world. It involves dancing and the giving of gifts somewhat reminiscent of Halloween candy. The Navajo have the Nightway Ceremony, and it takes place over several days. While not directly related to Halloween, it includes rituals and dances performed to promote healing and balance to the community. So during this time of year, each and every year, things get spooky, and things get serious for the people of the earth when summer ends and winter is almost upon us. Let's drink some tea, some Twining's tea. That's good tea. I love Twining's tea. All right, now on to today's topic of the 19th century, the spooky 19th century, a truly spooky topic. If ever we master time travel, I can't imagine how we could send people from future centuries back to the 19th or even earlier centuries to actually interact and live among the people of those times. I think it would be far, far too dangerous. The person would need to be a scholar of some renown, and even then, one wrong move, such as consuming the wrong, quote, medicine, unquote, or saying the wrong thing or taking a cue improperly, could land that person in prison or lead to their quick and painful death. I think if ever we do master time travel, that we should only send people from the future back to observe with no possibility of interaction. Let me begin. Many family historians spanning across generations often find themselves curious about and eager to unravel the lives and motivations of their ancestors. I know I did. One such ancestor in my family history owned a woolen mill starting in the 18th century, predating the American Revolution. It was a venture that spanned until nearly the mid-19th century. However, a significant shift occurred when they sold the mill and embarked on a remarkable journey across the country, settling in the then-distant West in 1839. They made the journey with oxen and wagons, carrying them and their belongings. Surprisingly, they completely transformed their occupation, transitioning from woolen mill owners to agriculturalists dealing with commodities. The driving force behind this dramatic change remained a captivating mystery. What prompted this family to make such a drastic shift in their livelihoods? Exploring the past can unveil some fascinating revelations, and it's likely that as you delve into your own ancestors' stories, you may encounter individuals who exhibited similar transformative behaviors. Was this change motivated by wanderlust, a thirst for adventure, 
or something that you hadn't yet considered. It is possible that it was motivated by a desire for farmland, but understand that the significance of such a move in the 19th century differed markedly from its modern connotation. Life during that time was a world apart, shaped by unique circumstances and opportunities. In the 19th century, life revolved around different values, pursuits, and constraints. Venturing across the vast and rugged terrain of the American frontier was not just an adventure. It was an arduous and perilous undertaking, driven by ambition, resilience, and the pursuit of new possibilities. Opportunities for economic prosperity and land ownership in the western frontier enticed many families to make daring moves and take on fresh challenges. As you explore your family's history, the enigmatic motivations behind their decisions become a gateway to understanding the socioeconomic context of the time. By appreciating the nuances of their lives, we gain insight into the broader tapestry of history and the diverse motivations that shape the destinies of our ancestors. Let's now consider the spooky 19th century and provide some historical context into how people lived and how they died. How about electricity? Well, in the 19th century, electric lighting was not widely available. Many major cities in the United States were lit by gas lights, but this was not so in rural America. There was no way to produce or transport gas without great loss, nor economically, and the infrastructure in rural America wasn't there. People across America relied on fireplaces, gas lamps, candles, or oil lamps for illumination. The electric light bulb was invented in 1879 by Thomas Edison. He filed his first successful patent for an electric lamp with a carbon filament on January 27, 1880. Flashlights and torches were also not invented until sometime around 1899 at the end of the 19th century. So we can see that after the sunset, or on cloudy, overcast, or rainy days, Darkness pervaded the 19th century, and spooky was the norm. I have a vivid memory of a day from my youth when I decided to buy an oil lamp to experience something of my ancestors. It was a fascinating pioneer-style lamp with a wick, and I was living in an apartment at the time. When I brought it home, I eagerly inserted the wick, filled it with oil, and lit it up. The warm glow it emitted was reminiscent of a candle, and I found it quite charming. As time passed, I drifted off to sleep. The next morning, I woke up, turned off the oil lamp, and headed to the bathroom for my usual morning routine. As I glanced into the mirror, I was shocked by what I saw. Black soot surrounded my nostrils, and it had even found its way into my hair. Alarmed, I hurried back to where the lamp was placed, and to my dismay, I noticed a thin layer of black soot covering the furniture and walls. It was a mess. That experience left a lasting impression on me, and needless to say, I never lit that lamp again. But I had a new appreciation for what my ancestors might have gone through using nothing but oil lamps and candles for light, and why they washed their walls in the spring. In the early years, electrification was primarily concentrated in urban areas where electricity was first used for street lighting and then gradually extended to businesses and residences. The first central power stations were built in the 1880s and by the 1890s, larger cities began to have some form of electrical distribution. However, widespread electrification across the entire country took much longer and was a gradual process into the 20th century. Rural areas in particular were slower to receive electricity due to the higher costs involved in extending power lines over long distances and serving sparsely populated regions. The really significant expansion of electrification in the United States took place in the early to mid 20th century. The Rural Electrification Administration, or REA, established as part of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal in 1935, 
played a crucial role in bringing electricity to rural areas. Through the REA's efforts, electricity was extended to many rural communities that had previously been without access to this modern utility. By the 1950s, most of the United States was electrified, with the vast majority of homes and businesses having access to electricity. However, some remote areas continued to be electrified in the following decades. People in the 19th century did not have central heating or air conditioning. Modern heating and air conditioning systems provide comfortable indoor temperatures regardless of the outside weather, which was not available in the 19th century. Central heating systems began to be introduced in the United States in the mid-19th century, so the 1850s, let's say. The concept of central heating involved heating a building from a central point and distributing the heat throughout the different rooms using ducts or pipes. Initially, central heating was primarily used in large public buildings, factories, and affluent homes. One of the early central heating systems in the United States was developed by the American engineer William Rankin around 1855. His system used steam to heat buildings, and it was installed in the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. However, it wasn't until the early 20th century that central heating became more widespread and accessible to a larger portion of the population. Advances in technology and the availability of fuels like coal, oil, and later natural gas made central heating systems more efficient and affordable for homes and businesses. When I was a boy in the 1950s, we lived in a small town in Illinois. In the basement, there was a huge furnace, which I believe burned gas at the time. It had been converted from burning coal. This furnace was almost as big as the room. It was very large, with plates on the outside that were hot, and that would burn you if you left your hand on them for any period of time. Air conditioning, on the other hand, was invented in the early 20th century. The first practical air conditioning system was developed by Willis Carrier in 1902. Initially, air conditioning was used primarily for industrial and commercial applications such as controlling humidity in printing plants and improving production processes in factories. Residential air conditioning systems started to gain popularity in the 1930s and 40s. However, it was a luxury and not common in most homes until after World War II. In the post-war economic boom, air conditioning systems became more affordable and their popularity soared, leading to the widespread adoption of residential air conditioning in the United States. Overall, both central heating and air conditioning became more prevalent in the United States during the 20th century, with central heating systems having an earlier introduction in the mid-19th century for larger buildings and affluent homes. So in the 19th century, to stay warm, you burned oil, gas, but mostly wood or coal. And to stay cool, you opened a window or used ice that you cut from the local river in winter and then stored in an ice house through the summer months. You used a fan, which you moved up and down with your hand. What about refrigeration? Nope. Refrigerators and freezers allow us to preserve food for longer periods, preventing spoilage and improving food safety. This was a luxury that 19th century individuals did not have. Food was jarred, canned, salted, or smoked to preserve it, or it was eaten fresh from the garden. Railroads began transporting food across the United States in the mid-19th century. The development of the railroad network in the United States significantly revolutionized transportation, including the movement of people, goods, and commodities, and food products. The first transcontinental railroad was completed on May 10, 1869, after the Civil War, when the Central Pacific and Union Pacific railroads were connected at Promontory Summit, Utah. This marked a major milestone in the expansion of the railroad system, allowing for more efficient and faster transportation of goods between the eastern and western parts of the country. After the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, 
railroads expanded rapidly throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries, connecting various regions of the United States. This expansion facilitated the movement of agricultural products, including crops, livestock, and processed food items from rural areas to urban centers and markets across the country. Prior to the establishment of the railroad network, food transportation was primarily done via slower and less reliable means such as horse-drawn wagons, river boats, and ships. The introduction of railroads provided a faster and more efficient way to transport perishable goods like fruits, vegetables, dairy products, and meats over long distances, reducing spoilage and improving food accessibility for people in different regions. The ability of railroads to transport food swiftly and reliably played a crucial role in supporting the growth of agricultural industries and fostering economic development throughout the United States. It also contributed to the establishment of a national food distribution system, ensuring a more consistent food supply across the country. The music tells us that it's time to take a break for a few minutes. We'll be right back to our spooky family history offering for Family History Month and Halloween, entitled The 19th Century and the Family Historian, with Sean Radcliffe. There's literally nothing spookier than the 19th century. Transmission intercepted. We interrupt. We interrupt. We interrupt your regularly scheduled programming. This is Mike Waddell, the Vice President of the Muscatine County Genealogical Society, and you're listening to Sean Radcliffe and Preservation Oaks on MicroStream Radio. The National Agricultural Center and Hall of Fame in Bonner Springs, Kansas. For over 60 years, the National Agricultural Center's mission has been to celebrate the American farmer and ranch, the value of the food, fiber and fuel, and the special beauty of America. The purpose of the National Agricultural Center and Hall of Fame is to educate society on the historical and present value of American agriculture and to honor leadership in agribusiness and academia by providing education, information, experience, and recognition. Learn more about your National Agricultural Center and Hall of Fame in Bonner Springs, Kansas at www.aghalloffame.com and provide your support for accomplishing the mission. You'll be glad you did. Explore the history of Onega, Kansas located in your own hometown and nestled in the heart of Onega at 309 East 2nd Street. Bring your family, bring a friend, or just come on down today to the Onega Historical Society to learn more about why they love Onega, Pottawatomie County in Kansas. Visit them at the Society's Facebook page today. Introducing a totally new experience. The Blackjack Battlefield and Nature Park, where you'll find state-of-the-art immersive environments, interactive exhibits, and dramatic films that will take you on an amazing journey to the beginnings of the American Civil War and the end of slavery in the United States. Discover a world of passions, skullduggery, and battles fought by abolitionist warriors in Kansas. The Blackjack Battlefield and Nature Park, their legacy is yours. Please join, volunteer, visit, and donate to them today. For more details, visit the website at blackjackbattlefield.org or email at info at blackjackbattlefield.org. Where can you experience hundreds of years of history in a single day? At the Winneshek County Historical Society in the heart of Decorah, Iowa. You'll find something for everyone at the Winneshek County Heritage Center located in the Landers Adams Bodensteiner House at 302 South Mill Street in Decorah. While you're there, be sure to tour the old Winneshek County Jail and the Locust Schoolhouse. Get hours, admissions, membership and volunteer opportunities by visiting them on the web at winneshekcountyhistoricalsociety.com or just call at 563-382-4166.
Explore the amazing life and legacy of Dr. Norman Borlaug by visiting the Norman Borlaug Heritage Foundation Farms at 19518 200th Street and 20399 Timber Avenue in Cresco, Iowa. Dr. Borlaug saved over a billion people from starvation on this planet. Bring your family, bring a friend and come on down to learn more about why they love to educate people about this great man and his legacy. For appointments, directions, and attending scheduled events, visit them at normanborlaug.org. You can email the foundation at nbhforg at gmail.com or call at 563-547-3434. You'll be glad you did. This is Cindy Maher, the Iowa State Coordinator of Iowa Gen Web. I had a lot of fun as a guest on Preservation Oaks. And now, back to Preservation Oaks. Welcome back. And now, here's Sean Radcliffe. What about indoor plumbing? I know, scary. Indoor plumbing, I define as access to running water, indoor toilets, and sewage systems. These things significantly improve hygiene and sanitation, but were not widespread in the 19th century. Indoor plumbing began to come into general use in the United States during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Before the widespread adoption of indoor plumbing, most homes relied on outhouses or chamber pots for sanitation needs, and water was typically fetched from wells or nearby water sources. The introduction and expansion of indoor plumbing were made possible by several technologies and societal developments. Number one, municipal water supply systems. In the late 19th century, cities and towns began to develop centralized water supply systems that brought treated water directly into homes and buildings. This made access to clean water more convenient and paved the way for indoor plumbing. Number two, improved pipe materials. The development of more durable and reliable pipe materials such as iron and later copper and plastic allowed for the creation of water distribution systems within buildings. Number three, sanitary sewers. The implementation of sanitary sewer systems enabled the efficient removal and disposal of wastewater from homes and buildings, improving overall sanitation and public health. Number four, flushing toilets. The invention of the flushing toilet, popularized by Thomas Crapper in the late 19th century, became a key component of indoor plumbing and significantly improved sanitation. And number five, bathroom fixtures. The production and availability of plumbing fixtures, including sinks, bathtubs, and showers, made indoor plumbing more practical and convenient for personal hygiene. While indoor plumbing started to become more prevalent in urban areas during the late 19th century, it was not until the early 20th century that it became more common in rural areas and smaller towns. The process of widespread adoption varied across regions with some rural communities adopting indoor plumbing later than larger urban centers. Now, my family lived in a small town in Illinois in the mid-20th century. In 1962, thereabouts, they were just putting in the larger sewer infrastructure for the town. My aunt lived on a farm and had a well for water and an outhouse. I also recall going to the bathroom in an outhouse during a camping trip with my family and being bitten by a large spider. Horrifying indeed. Overall, the widespread implementation of indoor plumbing in the United States was a gradual process that spanned several decades, but by the mid-20th century, it had become a standard feature in most homes and buildings throughout the country. Then there's transportation. 
In the 19th century, they used railroads in the late century, but for most of the century, they used ships and boats, horses, donkeys, and carriages and wagons for transportation. It was slow. It was hot or cold, depending on the season, and it was dusty or muddy or wet. As far as communications, there were no telephones. There were letters you wrote to your family or for business matters. There was no internet. The concept of electrical telegraphy began to take shape in the early 19th century. Inventors in different parts of the world, including Samuel Morse in the United States, were experimenting with ways to transmit messages over long distances using electric currents. Samuel Morse, an American artist and inventor, is credited with developing the practical telegraph system that bears his name. In the 1830s and 40s, Morse, along with his associate Alfred Vail, developed the Morse Code, a series of dots and dashes representing letters and numbers. This code became the foundation for telegraph communication. On May 24, 1844, almost halfway through the 19th century, Samuel Morse sent his first telegraph message from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, Maryland over a line that stretched approximately 40 miles. The message, What Hath God Wrought, marked a historic moment in communication history. Following the successful demonstration of the telegraph, telegraph lines began to spread rapidly across the United States, just as the Internet did in the 20th and 21st centuries. Heck, we're still putting in uh, Google Fiber right now in the United States. By the 1850s, major cities were connected and telegraph companies such as Western Union emerged to facilitate communication across the country. The telegraph revolutionized long-distance communication, making it possible to send messages quickly and efficiently over vast distances. It had a profound impact on business, news, and government communications. One of the most significant telegraph projects in the United States was the construction of the first transcontinental telegraph line, completed in 1861, just about the time the Civil War was starting. This line connected the eastern and western coast of the country, allowing for rapid communication across the continent. The telegraph's dominance as the primary means of long-distance communication began to wane with the invention and widespread adoption of the telephone in the late 19th century. While telegraph usage declined, it continued to be used for specialized purposes and remained in operation in some areas well into the 20th century. An example of that is that the War Department sent telegrams during World War II to families across America to notify them when their sons or daughters serving in the armed forces were wounded, missing, or killed in action, and that was in the 1940s. Overall, the telegraph played a crucial role in transforming communication and connecting the United States. It laid the foundation for future advancements in telecommunications and set the stage for rapid exchange of information that would become even more prevalent in the age of the Internet and digital communication. Here's something pretty scary. The people in the 19th century did not have the benefit of safety regulations and standards, much like we see in other third world countries today. Modern safety standards in construction, transportation, and consumer goods have greatly reduced the risk of accidents and injuries compared to the 19th century. They also didn't have the concept or access to personal protective equipment. In the modern era, we have access to various safety equipment such as helmets, seat belts, and safety gear for various activities and occupations which were not available in the 19th century. Modern households benefit from a wide range of labor-saving appliances like washing machines, dishwashers, microwave ovens, and vacuum cleaners, which were not present in 19th century homes. You did spring cleaning where you beat the rugs, washed the walls, scrubbed the floors, swept the chimneys, dug garbage in latrine pits, and so on. 
These are just a few examples of the safety and comfort improvements that have occurred over the decades, making our lives today much less scary, much different, convenient, and secure compared to those in the 19th century. People got hurt at work. People got hurt at home by using chemicals or other things that they were doing. Now, what about some of the main medical differences between people in the 19th century and people today? There are some significant medical differences between people in the 19th century and today. In the 19th century, people didn't have modern medicines and vaccines. Medical advancements in the 20th and 21st centuries have led to the development of vaccines, antibiotics, and better treatments for various diseases, significantly improving overall public health and life expectancy. If you broke your leg in the 19th century and the break wasn't clean, then either the leg would need to come off or there was a high risk that you would die of infection. In the 19th century, life expectancy was much lower compared to today. Advances in medicine, public health sanitation, and living conditions have significantly increased life expectancy in the modern era. The average life expectancy at birth during this period was around 40 to 50 years, depending on various factors such as socioeconomic status, location, and access to health care. Today, we have access to a wide range of vaccines that protect against many infectious diseases, whereas vaccines were limited or non-existent in the 19th century. The discovery of antibiotics didn't occur until the 20th century, and this revolutionized medicine, enabling effective treatment of bacterial infections that were often fatal in the 19th century. Modern surgical techniques and anesthesia have greatly improved patient outcomes and reduced pain during surgical procedures, which were much more rudimentary in the 19th century. Anesthesia was introduced and used in the 19th century. The use of anesthesia revolutionized medicine and surgery, allowing patients to undergo procedures without experiencing pain or discomfort. Prior to the development of anesthesia, surgical procedures were often performed on conscious patients, which could be excruciatingly painful and dangerous. The first successful use of general anesthesia is attributed to William Morton, a Boston dentist, who demonstrated the use of ether as an anesthetic during a surgical procedure in 1846. This event is often referred to as the ether dome operation, which took place at Massachusetts General Hospital. After the successful use of ether, other anesthetic agents such as chloroform were also introduced for medical use in the 19th century. The availability of anesthesia allowed for more complex and invasive surgeries to be performed, significantly improving patient outcomes and reducing the risk of complications. The development and widespread adoption of anesthesia marked a crucial milestone in the history of medicine and surgery, paving the way for the advancement of modern surgical techniques and medical procedures. Now, many of my ancestors, and probably many of yours, were soldiers in the Civil War. One of my ancestors lost his hand and another his leg, which led me to wonder if field hospitals during the Civil War in America had and used anesthesia. Well, according to the historical experts during the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865, field hospitals did use anesthesia, although its use was not as widespread as it is in modern medical practice. The Civil War marked a significant period in the advancement of medical practices and the use of anesthesia in the field of surgery. Ether and chloroform were the primary anesthetic agents used during the Civil War. These agents were administered to soldiers undergoing surgery to help alleviate pain and unconsciousness during the procedures. The use of anesthesia in field hospitals was especially important during amputations and other major surgeries, which were common due to the severity of battlefield injuries. 
However, it's important to note that the administration of anesthesia during the Civil War was not as standardized or precise as it is today. Anesthetics were often administered by non-medical personnel, and dosage control could be challenging. Additionally, the understanding of anesthesia's potential risks and the need for careful monitoring were not as advanced as in modern medicine. Despite the limitations and challenges, the use of anesthesia in field hospitals during the Civil War was a significant step forward in the development of surgical practices and patient care during wartime. It helped to alleviate the immense suffering experienced by wounded soldiers and contributed to advancements in anesthesia and surgical techniques that would be further refined in the decades to come. In the 19th century, there was no diagnostic imaging. Technologies like x-rays, MRI, and CT scans, which allow for non-invasive and accurate diagnosis of various medical conditions, were not available in the 19th century. The doctors were primarily guessing. Pretty scary. Believe it or not, there were also no blood transfusions. These have become a common medical procedure today, saving countless lives. This life-saving practice was not well established in the 19th century. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, significant advancement in the understanding of blood groups and the development of safer blood transfusion techniques laid the foundation for modern blood banking and transfusion practices. The establishment of blood banks and the discovery of the ABO blood group system by Carl Landsteiner in 1901 revolutionized blood transfusion medicine and made the procedure significantly safer and more effective. There also were no organ transplants, of course. These didn't occur until the 20th century. They were unthinkable in the 19th century. There were no real mental health treatments. The understanding and treatment of mental health conditions have significantly improved over the years with more advanced therapies, medications, and counseling available today. Pain management didn't really exist all that well in the 19th century. There was laudanum, whiskey, morphine, and opium prescribed for pain, including the pain of childbirth. Many people became addicted to these substances, which were not well understood at the time. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, morphine, cocaine, and other addictive drugs had limited restrictions on the sale and use of these substances in the United States. The regulation of drugs and the establishment of drug control laws didn't occur until much later in the 20th century. Pretty scary. In the 19th century, substances like morphine and cocaine were commonly used for medical purposes and were available over the counter without a prescription. Morphine was widely used for pain relief, especially during and after the Civil War, to treat soldiers' injuries and alleviate pain in various medical conditions. Cocaine, on the other hand, was used as a stimulant and was found in various patent medicines and tonics. It was often touted as a cure for various ailments and was readily available to the public. However, as the 20th century progressed, concerns about drug addiction and abuse grew. The realization of the harmful effects of certain drugs led to the passing of drug control legislation, including the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act in 1914, which regulated and taxed the production, importation, and distribution of opiates, including morphine and coca products, including cocaine. As drug-related problems persisted and drug abuse became a more significant social concern, further regulations were implemented, leading to the eventual criminalization of certain drugs. The Controlled Substances Act of 1970 enacted during the War on Drugs era, classified drugs into different schedules based on their potential for abuse, medical use, and safety profile. This act significantly restricted the production, distribution, and use of drugs like cocaine, heroin, and other addictive substances. Just like with tobacco products in the 20th century, 
As soon as society recognized that there was an unavoidable health issue, we moved to address it using legislative awareness and medical means. In the 19th century, people didn't get their health care insurance from their employers like they do today. There was no real health care insurance in the 19th century to help with the costs of medical treatment. Most people had to pay for medical care out of pocket, which could be a significant financial burden for those with serious or chronic illnesses. Some mutual aid societies and fraternal organizations offered limited health benefits to their members, but membership was usually restricted and the benefits were modest. These emerged in the mid to late 19th century. Government programs to help cover health costs were very limited. There were some public hospitals and almshouses for the poor, but they provided only basic care. Most people relied on churches and other informal social support networks, family, friends, and charities to help cover medical costs if needed, but for many, there was no financial assistance available. As a result, many people did not seek medical treatment due to the costs, leading to worse health outcomes and higher mortality rates, particularly among the poor. Employer-provided health insurance did not become standardized in the United States until the mid-20th century, and that trend didn't start until the 1930s. Many countries today mandate that all employers provide health care for their employees. As I mentioned previously, in the 19th century, before the establishment of modern social welfare programs, people in the United States relied on various social support networks and mutual aid societies to provide assistance during times of need. These networks were particularly important for individuals and families facing economic hardships, illness, or other challenges. Here are some types of social support networks and mutual aid societies that were prevalent during that period. There were fraternal organizations, also known as lodges or brotherhoods, which played a significant role in providing social and financial support. The members paid regular dues and received assistance during times of illness, unemployment, or death in the family. These organizations often had a strong sense of community and camaraderie. There were also mutual aid societies, and these were groups formed by individuals who shared common interests or backgrounds. They provided financial assistance, medical care, or burial benefits to members in times of need. Some mutual aid societies were based on ethnicity, occupation, or religion. There were friendly societies. These were similar to mutual aid societies and focused on providing financial assistance and support to members. These societies helped members with medical expenses, burial costs, and financial aid during periods of unemployment. There were benevolent associations. These were charitable organizations that provided assistance to the poor, widows, orphans, and the sick. They relied on donations and voluntary contributions to offer aid and support to those in need. There were church and religious organizations, of course, and these were institutions which played a significant role in offering support to their members and the broader community. They provided food, shelter, and financial assistance to the needy and promoted a sense of community and solidarity. There was community-based assistance, especially in rural areas and small towns. Communities often came together to support their members. Neighbors helped each other during times of hardship, providing food, shelter, and other forms of aid. There were women's clubs and societies. These were essential in providing support to women and their families. They focused on social welfare, education, and community improvement, often offering financial assistance and aid to those in need. There were ethnic and immigrant support networks. These were often formed to help new arrivals adjust to life in the United States. These networks provided language assistance, housing support, and employment opportunities. So, wherever your ancestors lived, you might look for these types of organizations to see if they helped your ancestors.
It's important to note that while these social support networks and mutual aid societies provided crucial assistance, they were limited in scope and couldn't address all the challenges faced by those in need. The development of more comprehensive social welfare programs and government support would come later in the 20th century to address broader societal needs. Okay, now a lot of scary things. In the 19th century, some of the leading causes of death were quite different from what they are today. Advances in medicine, public health, sanitation, and living conditions have significantly changed the causes of mortality over time. Here are some of the common causes of death in the 19th century. Infectious diseases. Diseases like tuberculosis, which they called consumption, pneumonia, influenza, and diphtheria were major killers in the 19th century, especially in urban areas where crowded living conditions facilitated their spread. Three months before I was born, my father passed away from tuberculosis that he picked up while serving in the U.S. Navy as a submariner during World War II. In the 19th century, tuberculosis was known as consumption. I've seen this on many death certificates from the time period. Tuberculosis was a highly prevalent and deadly disease during that era, and it earned the nickname consumption due to the way it seemed to consume the body slowly. Tuberculosis is a contagious bacterial infection that primarily affects the lungs but can also spread to other parts of the body. It was responsible for a considerable number of deaths in the 19th century, especially in overcrowded and unsanitary urban areas. Cholera outbreaks were devastating and widespread in the 19th century, leading to severe dehydration and death, particularly in areas with poor sanitation. Typhoid fever. Contaminated water and food sources were common causes of typhoid fever, contributing to its prevalence during this time. Dysentery caused by bacterial infections from contaminated water or food was a significant cause of death, particularly in unsanitary conditions. Diarrheal diseases often associated with poor hygiene and contaminated water were a leading cause of death, particularly among children. Childbirth complications Maternal mortality was relatively high in the 19th century, primarily due to childbirth-related complications and infections. Accidents and injuries, occupational hazards, lack of safety regulations, and limited medical care resulted in a higher incidence of fatal accidents and injuries. Malnutrition and starvation. Poverty and inadequate access to nutritious food led to malnutrition and, in extreme cases, starvation. Malaria was prevalent in certain regions of the United States, particularly in the South, and caused significant mortality. Heart disease, while not as common as in modern times, often referred to as heart dropsy or heart failure, was still a recognized cause of death in the 19th century. It's important to note that life expectancy was much lower in the 19th century and many diseases that are now preventable or treatable were significant threats to public health. Advances in medicine, sanitation, and public health measures in the 20th century have contributed to a significant decline in mortality from these causes. Very scary in the 19th century. The soothing melodies signal a brief intermission is in order. Don't go too far, as we'll soon return to our captivating presentation for Family History Month and Halloween. Titled, The 19th Century and the Family Historian, featuring the one and only Sean Radcliffe. In the realm of eerie tales, nothing quite compares to the mysteries of the 19th century.
join the Osage County Historical Society and Holly Genealogical Research Center and support their efforts to bring history to life for you and your family. Visit their website at osagechs.org and learn more about this valuable local nonprofit organization. Come for a visit to your beautiful museum at 631 Topeka Avenue in Linden, Kansas. Be sure to donate, join, and become a member today. You'll be glad you did. The Eudora Area Historical Society For close to 50 years, the Society's mission has been to preserve and maintain the history of the city and township of Eudora and the surrounding communities of Clearfield, Fall Leaf, Hesper, Prairie Center, and Weaver. Learn more about your society at www.cityofudoraks.gov backslash 100 backslash Eudora dash community dash museum or by visiting the Facebook page at Eudora Community Museum or call 785-690-7900 for more details, admissions, and hours. By all means join and support them in accomplishing the mission. Please join the rural Woodbury County Historical Society and support their efforts to bring history to life for you and your family. Visit them on Facebook and learn more about this valuable local nonprofit organization. Donate, join, become a member, and plan a visit to the museum today. You'll be glad you did. Pass history on by joining, visiting, donating and volunteering at Historic Tuscaloosa today. Historic Tuscaloosa is a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving the Tuscaloosa area's heritage. Their mission is to develop an awareness and appreciation of the historical and cultural heritage of the communities across Tuscaloosa County. The Historic Tuscaloosa Organization has been preserving and promoting Tuscaloosa County since 1966. They've enjoyed steady growth over the years, and they're recognized as one of the strongest preservation groups in the southeastern United States. Learn more at historictuscaloosa.org. If you have an event or a wedding you're planning, their beautifully preserved and maintained historic landmarks are a unique and beautiful venue for your guests. Just call 205-758-2238 or send email to info at historictuscaloosa.org to get started. The Alabama Agricultural Museum at Landmark Park's mission has been to preserve the natural environment and heritage of southeast Alabama's wiregrass region. Landmark Park is more than just a place to look. It is a place to participate and experience. Experience history on an 1890s living history farm, complete with an old farmhouse, smokehouse, cane mill, syrup shed, sheep, cows, chickens, and pigs. Drift back in time in a Victorian gazebo, a one-room schoolhouse, a drugstore and soda fountain, a country store, or a turn-of-the-century church. Experience nature with a walk through the woods on an elevated boardwalk, stroll nature trails, visit our interpretive center and planetarium. See wildlife exhibits and have a picnic in our picnic area. Experience the excitement of annual special events like folklife festivals, antique car shows, traveling exhibits, concerts, and workshops. Experience the heritage of the Wiregrass region and experience an adventure. Visit their website at landmarkparkdothan.com or call 334-794-3452 for more details, admissions, and hours. Donate, volunteer, and become a member today. You'll be glad you did. Nine out of ten genealogists agree. Preservation Oaks is the best podcast on the internet. And now, back to Preservation Oaks.
Welcome back. And now, let's hear from the enigmatic Sean Radcliffe. So apart from all of these scary, spooky things that were stacked against families in the 19th century, we also had a number of military engagements in the United States during the 19th century that would take men away from the family. The United States was involved in several military engagements, both within its borders and abroad. First, we had the War of 1812, which was fought between the United States and the United Kingdom, along with its Canadian and Native American allies. The war was primarily over issues such as maritime rights and the impressment of American sailors. It lasted from 1812 to 1815. Then we had the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1848. That conflict arose from disputes over the Texas border and resulted in the United States acquiring significant territory in the Southwest, including present-day California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and parts of Colorado and Wyoming. We had the Seminole Wars from 1817 to 1858. These were a series of conflicts with the Seminole Native American tribe in Florida who resisted relocation to Indian territory. We had the Indian Wars, various conflicts throughout the century, a series of conflicts between the U.S. government and the various Native American tribes as settlers pushed westward. Notable events include the Black Hawk War in the Midwest in 1832, the Second Seminole War, 1835 to 1842, and the Sioux Wars from 1854 to 1890. We had, of course, the Civil War from 1861 to 1865. We had the Spanish-American War in 1898, fought between the United States and Spain, leading to the United States acquiring territories such as Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. We had the Philippine-American War from 1899 to 1902, an armed conflict between the United States and the Filipino revolutionary seeking independence after the Spanish-American War. We had various conflicts with pirates and pirates' havens in North Africa, the Caribbean, and the Far East, collectively known as the Barbary Pirate Wars from 1801 to 1815. All right, so that could have impacted families. Then we had military drafts. So there were military drafts in the 19th century. The U.S. government employed conscription or drafts to raise troops for specific military engagement. For the Civil War, of course, from 1861 to 1865, both the Union and Confederate armies relied on conscription to bolster their forces. The Union introduced the first military draft in American history in 1863, leading to protests and riots in various cities, most notably the New York City draft riots in July 1863. Then there was the Enrollment Act of 1863. This act, passed by the U.S. Congress, established a national draft system in the United States. It required all able-bodied male citizens and immigrants to register for the draft and potentially serve in the military. There was the Confederate Conscription Acts. The Confederate government also enacted conscription measures to recruit soldiers which faced resistance from some citizens who were exempted or found ways to avoid service. Then there was the Mexican-American War drafts. During the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1848, the U.S. government relied on both volunteers and draftees to fill the ranks of the military. It's essential to note that drafts were often met with varying degrees of resistance with some individuals attempting to evade service through exemptions, hiring substitutes, or fleeing to avoid conscription. Additionally, the use of conscription during the Civil War was controversial and faced criticism from various quarters. Nonetheless, drafts played a significant role in raising armies and filling the ranks during certain military conflicts of the 19th century. Okay, what we've learned so far is that the 19th century was pretty spooky. 
Have you gained a more comprehensive understanding of the people living in the 19th century? The various hardships they faced forced them to come together as families, relying on each other and sharing knowledge to ensure survival. Let go and let God became a common mindset, seeking divine guidance and protection to navigate the uncertainties and challenges that could befall them and their loved ones. Living a clean life was one key to survival. Our ancestors were resilient and resourceful individuals who drew wisdom from their forebears, learning valuable lessons on how to thrive and avoid potential pitfalls. The transformations we've explored spanning the 19th to the 20th and 21st centuries highlight the evolving nature of our families' lives. Now, I'd like to share a few more changes to help you immerse yourself in the world of those who lived in the 19th century. By laying this background of differences between the 19th century and later periods, I hope you can better connect with your ancestors' experiences during that era. Thus far, we've discussed electricity, heating and air conditioning, refrigeration, transportation, sanitation, and indoor plumbing, medical knowledge and mental health care, communication, household labor-saving devices, addiction and pain management, causes of death and diseases, military engagement and service, and life expectancy. Now let's discuss farming and making a living off the land. The percentage of the U.S. population engaged in farming or agricultural activities underwent significant changes throughout the 19th century due to various factors such as industrialization, westward expansion, and changes in technology. Here's an approximate overview of the percentage of the U.S. population engaged in farming during each decade of the 19th century. In 1800, around 75% of the United States population were involved in agriculture. The vast majority of people lived in rural areas, and farming was the primary occupation. From 1810 to 1820, the percentage of the population engaged in farming remained relatively high at around 70 to 75 percent. In 1830, the percentage started to decline slightly with around 69 percent of the population involved in farming. In 1840, the trend continued with approximately 64 percent of the population engaged in farming. From 1850 to 1860, the percentage decreased further to around 53 to 58 percent reflecting the gradual rise of urbanization and industrialization. From 1870 to 1880, the percentage of the population engaged in farming continued to decrease, with around 48 to 51 percent involved in agriculture. In 1890, around 43 percent of the population were farmers, as the country continued to industrialize and urban centers grew. These percentages show a general trend of decreasing agricultural involvement throughout the 19th century as the United States transformed from a primarily agrarian society to a more industrialized and urbanized nation. The 19th century was a transformative period in American history, and several events had a significant impact on American families during this time. There was the Industrial Revolution, which brought about technological advancements and urbanization, which reshaped the economy and family dynamics. Families moved from rural areas to cities seeking work in factories, leading to changes in family structures and roles. The Industrial Revolution was a period of significant technological advancements and societal changes that began in the late 18th century and continued through much of the 19th century. As a family historian, you could see your family moving into cities during this time or working in factories instead of on farms, depending upon the size of the communities they lived in. Or they could have an occupation listed on the census record in one of these new industries. Another event that had a significant impact on American families during the 19th century 
and that family historians could see in the 1870, 1880, and other census records was westward expansion. The rapid expansion of the United States westward resulted in migration and settlement of new territories. Families faced challenges and opportunities as they ventured into the frontier to establish new lives. There was the Homestead Act of 1862, which was interesting because that was during the Civil War. The Homestead Act provided land to individuals willing to settle and cultivate it, affecting family dynamics and opportunities for land ownership in the Western territories. The Homestead Act encouraged westward migration by offering 160 acres of public land to any adult U.S. citizen or intended citizen who was willing to live on and cultivate the land for five consecutive years. This led to a massive influx of settlers moving westward, seeking new opportunities, the chance to own their own land. Think about that. Think about how many people living in urban areas of the United States today, feeling trapped, would want to change their lives if we would do something like this now. Would they? Five years, not a 30-year mortgage to some bank, but 160 acres for five years. So where was this land? Well, Nebraska was a major destination for homesteaders due to its fertile plains and agricultural potential. Kansas also attracted many homesteaders who sought to establish farms on the Great Plains. Some of your ancestors may have participated in what they called the Land Run of 1889. After that, Oklahoma Territory saw a significant influx of homesteaders. The Dakota Territory, which later became North and South Dakota, was a popular area for homesteaders. Montana's open lands and agricultural opportunities drew homesteaders to the state. The Homestead Act played a role in the settlement and development of Colorado. Wyoming was another western state where homesteaders staked claims. Parts of New Mexico were available for homesteading, particularly after the passage of the Enlarged Homestead Act of 1909. While not as popular as some other states, Oregon also saw homesteading activity. What did those folks, possibly your ancestors, get out of homesteading? Well, they got land ownership, of course, 160 acres. The act provided an unprecedented opportunity for American families, including many immigrants and freed slaves, to become landowners. It offered an affordable means for families to acquire land and build a better life for themselves and future generations. There were economic opportunities. Homesteaders were often motivated by the potential economic opportunities that owning land could provide. By cultivating the land and establishing farms, families could produce crops for sustenance and sale, as well as raise livestock for profit. The Homestead Act also offered social mobility to many families who were previously limited in their opportunities. Owning land provided a sense of independence and autonomy, allowing families to improve their economic and social status. Encouragement of Family Settlements The Act also incentivized families to settle together on the same plot of land as it required continuous residence and improvements for five years. This encouraged familial support and cooperation in building homes and establishing farms. The Homestead Act facilitated the transformation of vast stretches of the American frontier into productive agricultural lands. While the Homestead Act offered opportunities, the reality of establishing farms on often challenging and undeveloped land wasn't without difficulties. Families faced hardships, including harsh weather, isolation, and crop failures, especially in arid regions. Did you know that the Homestead Act continued to be in effect until 1976, although the amount of land available under the Act decreased over time? This act remains a crucial chapter in American history, representing the government's effort to promote westward expansion 
land ownership and opportunities for American families to settle and prosper on the frontier. A major turning point in the 19th century that impacted our nation's families was, of course, the abolition of slavery in the United States. The Civil War caused immense social and economic disruptions. Families endured separation, loss, and displacement during the conflict. I once read a book called, um, I think it was called The Gray and the Blue, or The Blue and the Gray. It was all about how in the Civil War, when it started, families had to make decisions. And some family members were for the Confederates, and some family members were for the Union. And they often joined, you know, those various armies, even though they were from the same family. And they often fought each other in battle. And they would send messages back and forth to each other right before the battles. It was a very interesting book. The abolition of slavery was achieved through a number of steps in the United States. The first of which was the act prohibiting importation of slaves in 1807, which was a United States federal law that provided that no new slaves were permitted to be imported into the United States. It took effect on January 1, 1808, which was the earliest date permitted by the United States Constitution. You see, in order to ratify the Constitution across all the 13 states, they had to give and take. And one of the give and takes was that they couldn't pass anything abolishing slavery until 1808. And so this, this law took effect on January 1st, 1808, which was the earliest date permitted by the U.S. Constitution. Then there was the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 and the 13th Amendment in 1865, which impacted African-American families, giving them newfound freedom and rights. All of these things and more changed the laws, led to migrations, and so family historians seeking African-American ancestors will see these changes in the records available to them, and there are a number of excellent resources helping with this research. Another 19th century event that had an impact for family historians was the women's suffrage movement, which went on throughout the 19th century. It was a significant and transformative movement that aimed to secure voting rights for women in the United States. If your female ancestor was in the territory of Wyoming after 1869, then there may be voting records for her because... Wyoming Territory granted women the right to vote in 1869. By 1900, Colorado, Idaho, Utah, and other states had extended the right to vote to women for specific types of elections or on certain issues. It's also quite likely that you may have an ancestor that came into the United States from another country during the 19th century. Mass immigration from China, Russia, Ireland, Germany, and other European countries led to increased cultural diversity but also posed challenges for families adapting to new life in America. The Irish Famine, also known as the Great Famine or the Great Hunger, occurred primarily between 1845 and 1852 in Ireland. The most devastating years of the famine were 1846 to 1849. However, the impact of the famine extended beyond these years, and its repercussions were felt for decades. The famine was caused by a devastating potato blight, a disease that destroyed the potato crop, which was a staple food for the majority of the Irish population. The blight led to widespread crop failure, resulting in severe food shortage and famine conditions. As a result of the potato blight, Ireland experienced widespread hunger, malnutrition, and starvation. It's estimated that over a million people died, and around one million more emigrated from Ireland during and after the famine, seeking refuge and better opportunities in other countries, particularly the United States. Many came into the eastern United States, but quite a lot of immigrants came directly into the United States' Midwestern heartland to farm and raise families and build lives. 
continuing the nightmare of the 19th century. If you find children or adults missing from the census records, it may not necessarily be due to diseases, depending upon where they lived and the state of the family. During the 19th century, poor working conditions and child labor practices in factories led to debates about workers' rights and eventually the establishment of labor unions to advocate for better conditions, but not until the 20th century. During the 19th century, industrial labor conditions were often harsh and dangerous, especially in the early stages of industrialization. The Industrial Revolution brought about significant changes in manufacturing and production methods leading to the growth of factories in urban centers. Here are some key aspects of industrial labor conditions during the 19th century, or should I say the spooky 19th century. While there were long working hours, workers in factories and mills often labored for long hours, sometimes up to 14 to 16 hours a day, six days a week. There were limited or no regulations regarding working hours, and the concept of a standard eight-hour workday was not yet established. There were low wages. Wages were generally low, especially for unskilled laborers and child workers. The majority of workers struggled to earn a living wage, and poverty was widespread. There were unsafe working conditions. Factories and mills were often poorly maintained with little regard for worker safety. Machinery was frequently unguarded, leading to frequent accidents and injuries. Workers faced hazards such as exposed moving parts, toxic fumes, and dangerous working conditions. In the 19th century, there were few or no laws protecting workers' rights or ensuring safe working conditions. Employers had significant power over their workers and often exploited them for maximum profit. Child labor was prevalent during the 19th century, particularly in industrialized areas. Children as young as five or six years old were employed in factories and mines to perform various tasks. They worked long hours under the same dangerous conditions as adult workers for meager pay. Child labor was seen as an economic necessity for many families who were struggling to survive. Children's wages were often crucial to supplementing the family income and keeping them out of extreme poverty. As the 19th century progressed, concerns about the exploitation of workers, including child laborers, grew. Labor movements and trade unions began to form to advocate for better working conditions, higher wages, and reduced working hours. The fight for workers' rights led to the gradual implementation of labor laws and regulations aimed at improving industrial labor conditions. In the United States and other countries, labor activists and reformers played a crucial role in bringing about changes that eventually improved the lives of workers and curtailed child labor. Overall, the 19th century witnessed significant challenges in industrial labor conditions, but it also set the stage for the labor rights movement and labor laws that have continued to evolve into the modern era. Now, if you're researching Native American ancestors, then of course, the 19th century was a disaster for them. The forced relocation of Native American tribes such as the Trail of Tears and the conflicts with the U.S. government significantly impacted Native American families, leading to loss of land and cultural upheaval. Native American resettlement and conflicts occurred throughout much of the 19th century as the United States government pursued a policy of westward expansion and sought to displace and control Native American tribes. The history of interactions between the U.S. government and Native American tribes during this period is complex and often marked by broken treaties, violence, and the loss of Native American lands and culture. As genealogists, we must be aware of these events because we may be called upon to research ours or other families with Native American ancestors. The Mellow Melodies signal a brief interlude. Please stay tuned 
As we're on the cusp of recommencing our captivating presentation for Family History Month and Halloween, entitled The 19th Century and the Family Historian, featuring the unparalleled Sean Radcliffe. In the realm of hair-raising tales, there are scant contenders for the horrors of the 19th century. God. I think I've had a bit too much history. I think I've been thrown into an alternate reality. Sort of a parallel universe kind of thing. Hmm, no, I think it's just that I'm identifying so much with the people of the past. Excellent. This is kinda nice, knowing how things really work and using history to make better decisions for the future. I'm kind of digging this. Wow. I love history. Oh my goodness. Okay now, that's much better. Let's keep on listening. Wherever you get your podcast groove on, you can get all the history you can eat anytime with Preservation Oaks. Join other listeners at preservationoaks.podbean.com and let us know what you think by sending email to preservationoaks at gmail.com. I am General Matto van du Maximanus from the planet you refer to as BD 114672C. I am the legate of the second AB Picturis B region, governor of the approaches to NU Octantis AB, interplanetary consul, commander of the legions of AB Picturis A, 91 Aquari B, Mulionis B, and Gamma Library B, and I listen to Preservation Oaks on MicroStream Radio. Remember that feeling of wonder when you learn something fascinating about the past for the very first time? The Dorset Historical Society is bringing the past back to life. Their goal is to celebrate the rich history and culture of the Dorset, Vermont area. Be a part of the action by volunteering and supporting the Dorset Historical Society. Visit dorsetvthistory.org and learn more about this valuable local nonprofit organization. Please donate, volunteer, and become a member. Or visit them today at Route 30 at Kent Hill Road, Dorset, Vermont 05251. This is well worth your support and you'll have fun at the same time. Step into the captivating history of Clark County, Nevada, with a visit to the Clark County Museum, nestled in the heart of Henderson, right in your own hometown. Whether you're with family, friends, or exploring solo, the museum offers a fascinating journey into why Clark County is truly special. Discover the wonders of Clark County Museum online at clarkcountynv.gov museum, or better yet, come down and experience it firsthand at their convenient location. 1830 South Boulder Highway, Henderson, Nevada. The doors are open daily from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., and admission is a mere $2 for adults and $1 for seniors and children, making it accessible to all. For group tours and inquiries about special rates, simply call 702-455-7955 to make reservations. Don't forget, by becoming a museum member, you become a cherished part of the museum's community. Memberships are available at www.clarkcountymuseumguild.com. They are always open and ready to welcome you with open arms. Are you curious about your family's past? Are you planning a heritage trip to travel back to your roots? Whether you need help getting started or you've been researching for decades, you can get the help you need by connecting with the Muscatine County Genealogical Society located in Muscatine, Iowa. Become a member of the Muscatine County Genealogical Society and support their efforts to grow and to help make your research successful. For contact information and much more, visit their website at iagenweb.org backslash 
Muscatine, and learn more about this valuable local nonprofit organization. Donate and become a member today. With the help and expertise they can provide, you'll move your research light years ahead. And now, back to Preservation Oak. Welcome back, and without any more delay, let's plunge into the 19th century world with Sean Radcliffe. Now that you have a pretty good picture of what societal life was like in the 19th century for our ancestors, I'll discuss the last aspect of the 19th century that greatly impacted American families and that is still impacting American families today in the 21st century. That is, economic or banking failures or panics. In the 20th and 21st centuries, we've experienced the following banking panic events. There was the banking panic of 1901, a U.S. economic recession that started a fight for financial control of the Northern Pacific Railway. There was the panic of 1907, a U.S. economic recession with bank failures. There was the Great Depression, the worst systemic banking crisis of the 20th century. There was the saving and loan crisis of the 1980s, the 1990s in the United States. There was the Rhode Island banking crisis. There was the 1998 collapse of long-term capital management. In the 21st century, we've had the global financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, including the subprime mortgage crisis in the U.S. starting in 2007. That included the 2008 United Kingdom Bank Rescue Package, the 2009 United Kingdom Bank Rescue Package, the 2008-2009 Belgian Financial Crisis, the 2008-2011 through 2011 Icelandic Financial Crisis, the Great Recession in Russia, the 2008 through 2009 Ukrainian financial crisis, the 2008 through 2014 Spanish financial crisis, the post-2008 Irish banking crisis, and the 2023 global banking crisis. And there were and are impacts to families from these, but nothing like the impacts that occurred in the 19th century. Now, if you'd like to see some of the impacts in days gone by, just go to your favorite newspaper archive and do a quick search for the term bank failures or bank panic, and you'll see what I mean. Why is knowing about 19th century bank failures important to genealogists? Well, in the 19th century, there was very little protection for bank depositors if a bank failed. If a family was impacted by a bank failure, there were generally three outcomes. They would lose their savings and assets completely, and there was no recourse. They may also lose their employment and face poverty if their employer was also impacted. They may also face homelessness and displacement. There weren't any safety nets. There was no federal deposit insurance until the 1930s. The FDIC was created during the Great Depression to insure bank deposits and protect depositors. If a bank fails today, depositors are protected up to $200,000. State banking regulations varied and were often lax. Many states had no requirements for banks to reserve funds to cover deposits in case of failure. When a bank failed, depositors would typically lose most or all of their deposits. They became unsecured creditors with little chance of recovering their funds. Bank runs were common when rumors spread of a bank being in trouble. Depositors would rush to withdraw their funds before the bank failed, which often caused otherwise solvent banks to collapse. The lack of deposit insurance and weak banking regulations led to frequent bank panics and failures in the 19th century, eroding public trust in the banking system. 
Wealthy depositors may have been able to negotiate with banks to get some of their deposits back after a failure, but most small depositors had little recourse and lost their savings. Most bank depositors in the 19th century had absolutely no guarantees and bore the risk of a bank failing. They had to rely on a bank's reputation and financial health with no backup from the government. Many depositors suffered losses during periods of bank instability and panics. Unemployment and poverty had profound and often devastating impacts on families during the 19th century. The economy of the 1800s was marked by significant fluctuations, periodic economic crisis, and a lack of robust society safety nets, leaving many families vulnerable to financial hardships. And because of this, unemployment and poverty in the 19th century had far-reaching consequences for families, impacting their physical health, mental well-being, and social cohesion. It wasn't until the early 20th century that efforts were made to establish more comprehensive social welfare programs in the United States to address these challenges. Determining an exact percentage of the United States population that faced homelessness or displacement due to banking panics in the 19th century is challenging because comprehensive and accurate data on homelessness during that period is limited. Homelessness was not systemically tracked or recorded as it is today. During the major banking crises of the 19th century, such as the Panic of 1819, Panic of 1837, the Panic of 1857, and the Panic of 1873, significant economic downturns and mass bankruptcies occurred. As a genealogist, if you see your target family suddenly move or move in with other relatives, you may be able to attribute the cause to one of these events. Many people lost their jobs and families faced financial hardships, which could lead to displacement or homelessness. However, the extent of homelessness and displacement varied across different crises and regions, so it can be difficult. It's probably more appropriate to say that banking events in the 19th century had a considerable impact on families and individuals, often resulting in increased poverty, unemployment, and housing insecurity. Many families lost their homes and were forced to seek temporary shelter with relatives, friends, or in crowded and unsanitary tenement housing. Others may have been forced to migrate to different areas in search of work or support. The lack of comprehensive data on homelessness in the 19th century makes it challenging to quantify the exact percentage of the population affected. However, historical accounts and studies of the era suggest that the impact of banking panics on homelessness and displacement was significant and played a role in shaping social and economic conditions during that time. So please keep it in mind. So here's the bank failures in the 19th century. There was the Panic of 1819, a U.S. recession with bank failures, the culmination of U.S.'s first boom-and-bust economic cycle. There was the Panic of 1837, a U.S. recession with bank failures, followed by a five-year depression. There was the Panic of 1857, a U.S. recession with bank failures. There was the Panic of 1873, a U.S. recession with bank failures, followed by a four-year depression. There was the Panic of 1884, which impacted the United States and Europe. There was the Panic of 1893, a U.S. recession with bank failures. So the Panic of 1819 was the first major financial crisis of the United States after the War of 1812. It was characterized by a collapse of land prices, widespread foreclosures on mortgages, and bank failures. The Panic of 1837 One of the most severe economic downturns in U.S. history was triggered by speculative lending practices. The burst of the speculative bubble in land and commodity prices, particularly in the western United States and the failure of two major banks, it was exacerbated by the implementation of the Specie Circular an executive order issued by President Andrew Jackson requiring public lands to be purchased with gold and silver 
leading to a contraction of credit. This resulted in numerous bank failures and in a severe economic depression. The Panic of 1837 was one of the most severe economic downturns in the history of the United States. It had far-reaching impacts on the country, transforming economic, political, and social landscape. Then we move on to the Panic of 1857. This crisis was triggered by the decline of international trade, particularly the collapse of the Ohio Life Insurance and Trust Company, and particularly the California gold export to Europe, and the bursting of speculative bubbles in railroads and land. Many banks faced liquidity issues and suspended specie payments, the ability to convert banknotes into gold or silver, causing significant financial turmoil. It led to a financial panic and widespread bank failures contributing to a severe economic recession that lasted until 1859. The Panic of 1873, the primary cause was the overexpansion of railroad construction and related investments leading to widespread bankruptcies, bank failures, and an economic depression known as the Long Depression. This crisis was sparked by the failure of the investment bank J. Cook & Company and quickly spread to other financial institutions. The J. Cook & Company was a major banking firm that was heavily invested in railroad securities. The panic led to widespread bank failures, an economic downturn, and a period of deflation that lasted until the mid-1870s. Panic of 1884 was a financial crisis that occurred during that year and it led to the failure of several banks across the country. During panics and economic downturns, banks faced a run on their reserves as depositors rushed to withdraw their money, leading to liquidity problems and, in some cases, bankruptcy. The Panic of 1893, this crisis was caused by the collapse of the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad and other railroads and financial institutions. It resulted in a severe economic depression that lasted until 1897, and led to numerous bank failures and business bankruptcies. Additionally, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act and a run on the United States Gold Reserves further worsened the situation. The Panic of 1893 was a severe financial crisis that had profound and long-lasting impacts on the United States. These financial crises were significant events that had far-reaching consequences for the United States economy and shaped the nation's approach to financial regulation and economic policies in the years that followed. It's essential to note that the banking system in the 19th century was more decentralized and less regulated compared to the modern banking system. The establishment of a central bank, the Federal Reserve System, in 1913 brought significant changes to the banking sector, centralizing monetary policy and regulating the banking industry. The states that were most impacted by banking crises is in the 19th century. So if you're researching and your family lived in one of these states, they could have been impacted. The banking panics in the 19th century impacted various states in the United States, but certain regions were more vulnerable due to specific economic factors. The crisis's severity and impact varied from one event to another, and different states experienced different degrees of economic distress. Here are some states that were particularly affected by the major banking crises of the 19th century. States in the western and southern regions of the United States were significantly impacted by the banking crises in the 19th century. These states experienced rapid expansion, speculative booms, and land price bubbles, leading to the burst of the speculative bubble and severe economic downturns. States like Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin were among those hit hardest during the Panic of 1819, the Panic of 1837, the Panic of 1857. These were known as the West in those days. New York, as a major financial and commercial center, was heavily affected by several banking crises. 
New York City was the hub of banking and trade, and as such, it experienced significant disruptions during the Panic of 1837, the Panic of 1857, and the Panic of 1893. Pennsylvania, with its industrial and commercial development, was also vulnerable to financial crisis. Philadelphia, as a major economic center, experienced notable impacts during the Panic of 1837 and Panic of 1873. California was heavily impacted by the Panic of 1873 due to its exposure to international trade, reliance on the mining industry, and significant railroad investments. Mississippi and Louisiana experienced considerable difficulties during the Panic of 1819 and Panic of 1837 as they were heavily dependent on agriculture, especially cotton, and had extensive exposure to land speculation. It's important to note that the effects of these crises were not limited to specific states, but often had ripple effects on the broader U.S. economy. Additionally, the impact on individual states varied depending on their economic structure, reliance on specific industries, and exposure to risky financial practices prevalent during that time. In conclusion, the spooky 19th century witnessed a series of significant banking crises, influenced by economic, financial, and regulatory factors. The United States experienced a cycle of economic booms and busts during this period, often driven by speculative bubbles, excessive bank lending, and insufficient regulatory oversight. The absence of a central banking system also added to the financial system's instability. These crises highlighted the necessity for improved financial regulation culminating in the establishment of the Federal Reserve System in 1913 to address such issues in the future. The economic challenges of the 19th century brought forth periods of hardship and suffering, leaving the impression that federal and state governments were unable to address them effectively. The progressive movement emerged as a response to the recurring financial panics of that era. In the early 20th century, financial reforms were implemented, reducing the likelihood of economic collapses. However, the Great Depression demonstrated that these problems could not be entirely prevented, highlighting the complexity of addressing economic crisis. It's also essential to acknowledge that even into the 21st century, Banking panics, depressions, and recessions persist. As a global community, it's imperative for our brightest minds to collaborate and find solutions to mitigate these disruptions to our daily lives and our families. All right, that wraps up our discussion on the really scary and spooky 19th century and our contribution to the October Family History Month. Believe me, you don't want to go back there for anything but view-only visits if we ever get time travel working. We here today should feel incredibly lucky that our ancestors survived, and that we're even here at all with everything that was stacked against them during that century. I trust we pulled together enough information about this interesting and marvelous century that will provide listeners with valuable insights into the lives of their ancestors who lived in the 19th century. These individuals were resilient and industrious, driven by the necessity to sustain and protect their families, ensuring a legacy that would endure through the generations. Their hard work, clean living, and determination laid the foundation for the prosperous lives we lead today. For family historians, you can take each of the points covered in this podcast and list them down and then consider each when researching ancestors in the 19th century. I think that kind of checklist might help you both to make progress and to understand what really happened in the lives of your ancestors as you look at the information left behind about them. Good luck. Also, happy Halloween to everyone. Please note that I'm not a historian. I don't claim to be. I'm just a curious person interested in history. I'm as certain as can be that I probably missed something. If that's so, please offer your time and expertise to help correct any issues, and I thank you for it. If you have any questions or comments, please send them to preservationoaks at gmail.com. If you're interested in delving deeper into the 19th century, 
The internet offers a wealth of information to explore. A quick search will provide you with various resources and historical accounts to expand your knowledge on this fascinating topic. Happy learning. Okay, that's a wrap for this episode. Music used today is from Symbol Bird, Score Wizards, Pably CMM01, Red Octopus, U Music, Lucky Black Cat, and Scott Holmes. You can visit us at www.microstreamradio.com. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted by Microstream Radio. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere without the written permission of Microstream Radio. Thanks to everybody for listening. This is Sean Thomas Radcliffe. We'll see you all next time on Preservation Oaks. And until then, keep on giving and keep on living the good life.